Are you ready? Because I want you to pay attention. This is the beginning of something. Do you have time to improve your life? Do you have precisely 30 seconds for a word from Accutron watches? The watch appears, bottom third. The second hand moves with a fluid sweep. And above it, Accutron time. You go into a business meeting. Is there food in your teeth, ashes on your tie? And you've got nothing to say. The meeting is boring, but you can't be. But you're wearing an Accutron. This watch makes you interesting. It's a boardroom. It's black and white. We hear light traffic, no talking. We just see our man, you. Late 20s, shaggy, with a youthful colic, but in a suit and tie. This is a businessman, staring at his watch as muffled conversation swirls around him. Now we just hear the electronic hum. Um. He stands up, and the faces come into view. A couple of white-haired men and a contemporary who looks like Steve McQueen. You shake hands, and Steve McQueen gets a look at your watch. We hear the first words. Is that Swiss? Now we're in color, and it's a little interview for the two of them while the other men look, outlining the benefits of this watch. It is Swiss. It is accurate. It is the height of design and technology. Accutron. It's not a timepiece. It's a conversation piece. Wow, Freddie. That's a home run. We, we really want to bring some comedy um, to what we're doing. Have an opportunity to talk about how social influencers play a role in all of what's happening in television and video. So I, I'm really pleased to have the opportunity to have Sean Finnegan join us um, with Joel Murray here up on stage. So uh, that scene, we, we, we shot it right down here at the Chicago Center, Chicago, Los Angeles Center Studios. But um, the first take, they told me it was gonna be one piece. And it's pretty daunting to have Matt Weiner give you the first minute and a half of a, a, the final season of Mad Men. And uh, like John Hamm has a photographic memory, and uh, so you gotta have your act together when you show up. But they did this pull out shot on me and uh, I did the whole thing, didn't mess up, and the cameraman came up to me after the first take and goes, you know, you didn't blink. I'm like, what? You didn't blink during that whole take. What kind of thing is that to say to an actor right now? Well, related to the Freddie Rumson at uh, your character on Mad Men and everything you, we, we sat and listened to, uh, all the many uh, acronyms and terms, addressable, RTB, programmatic, OTT, ASVOD, Unicast. What, what would Freddie Rumson think about this right now? Well, he'd be, uh, he was a dinosaur then, so <laughs> he'd be really out of the game now. Um, you know, back then, it, it was about an image. You know, what, what kind of man reads Playboy? You know, what, what kind of guy drives a Cadillac? It was, it was kind of a, create a club that you wanted to be part of. And uh, nowadays, a, a lot of ads, you know, what was that? You know, why is a, a guy turning into a horse trying to sell men's cologne? I, you know, so, so much of it is confusing now. So I, I think Freddie would be back on the bottle and just hammered pretty much all the time. A <laughs> uh, little sidebar, we'll get back into advertising, but, but tell us a little bit about what you're up to these days. Oh, well, I've had a crazy month. Um, I, I do a live Whose Line Is It Anyway show called Who's Live Anyway, and we, we tour around the country, Ryan Stiles, Greg Proops, and Jeff Davis and I. And uh, so I've been doing a show in Chicago, which was a good scam to do a show for CISO, NBC's online platform, uh, called Shrink. So I was doing that basically Tuesdays and Wednesdays, and then going to Seattle or Portland or Vancouver and doing the show on the weekend. And, having to carry my 49 and a half pound suitcase uh, loaded with this kind of stuff. Um, so it, it's been a crazy, crazy time. And then I got to be there for some of the Cubs playoff games and uh, three of the World Series games. So Are you guys catching out. the shoes here too? They're subtle. Tell, tell us a little bit about that. You, it was a great story. There's a 18 year old girl came up to me at Harry Carey's the other morning and had a pair of these for myself and my brother Bill. His have. Uh, Ernie Banks homage on him, mine are Ron Sano, but 18-year-old uh, girl, I said, you know, I don't know what your business model is, but giving away free shoes to rich guys is not probably the way to go about things. And she kind of laughed at me and uh, 
sure enough, within a couple hours of putting him on Facebook, I had people contacting me, how do I get a hold of that girl? John Hamm got a hold of me and said he wanted a Cardinals pair, and uh, Billy was wearing them at the game last night and got them on the t television screen. So uh, the 18-year-old girl knows what's going on. She's got quite a website, and she's been doing it since she was 14. And I, I can't even get my kid to clean up the poop in the yard, you know, <laughs> which he gets an allowance for. But here, this girl's killing it, so. Well, on this, uh, speaking of uh, Bill and in, uh, in, in some of the clothes, you uh, launched the William Murray line as well of clothing? Yeah, that was all part of my carrying my big suitcase. And we went out oh. to New York. Uh, I went out and represented the brothers. And uh, we, we launched this William Murray golf line uh, in conjunction with the Chive. Um, we were going to do it ourselves. We were going to be Murray Brothers Golf, and uh, these guys contacted me. I, they had a, one of their executives uh, get in a cart with me, and this girl showed me a whole deck of ideas and uh, what they had planned. And I, you know, I don't like all that, and I like this, and blah blah blah. But she sat in my golf cart during our charity golf tournament down in St. Augustine uh, for about an hour and a half, and. Uh, the fact that they get 11 million hits a day uh, would probably get it out there a lot quicker than the, the Murray brothers, because we're basically lazy and slow. <laughs> and um, sure enough, the shirts that we've released, the, the Cub shirt that Bill was wearing at the game last night sold out in six hours. Uh, pretty much everything we released uh, two weeks ago sold out in the first 24 hours. And that was with the whole server and everything going down for a couple hours, because it was uh, crashed. And, uh, but it's, it's going well, and uh, we've got a goofy kind of scarcity model that we're going to only release certain shirts a certain amount, and you might collect them like Beanie Babies. And uh, so you'll see a guy going, how the hell did you get that one? Well, right. I, I called in at 6 a.m. the first day. Well, it's, if it was up to this crowd, you'd be able to you know, basically order right from the screen, you know, target that and click and get your, get your, uh, get your data and have it purchased and sent. Well... They're ahead of us, but we did pretty well. So, uh, you know, back to your, you've been in over 250 films and movies, writer, producer, director, all these things. And, you know, obviously this is one of your iconic characters, but you have many others. With all the distribution that's going on these days, all this over the top, the Hulu, Amazon, Netflix, et cetera, and even getting into the rise of some of this technology and TV, um, what, what's your take when you're producing content are you thinking about those things, like how it's going through to reach many, many people different ways? As an actor, I, I'm on, you know, what, Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, and uh, I, I try to put things out there and uh, get some attention that way. I mean, there's people getting jobs because of the number of Facebook friends and, and Twitter followers they have, which is kind of crazy because, you know, Actresses get more prison mail than guys ever get. You know, it's it's, it's loaded the other way. It's not fair, but uh, you know, if uh, if that's the value of it, it has nothing to do with how much stage time you've ever had, what you've been in b before. It's you do this funny voice on YouTube, and now you've got six million followers. So we're going to put you know put you in a sitcom, even though you've never really acted on a stage or a, in a studio. It, it's, it's obscene, but uh, it's going on. So you play along and you, you try to get your followers and get verified and you know, all that. And uh, it, it's kind of funny. Like, I, did, I couldn't get verified in Twitter for about it, two years. I'm like, really? Um, no? OK. All right, well, whatever. But I finally did. So, whoo, I got a blue dot. <laughs> You're legit. Mm -hmm. um, so this is an advertising crowd here. Turns and, out. Yeah, I think so. Lot, lots, of, lots of acronyms. Mm -hmm. But um, these, these people do find uh, that content obviously fuels the beast here, et cetera. Um, when you're out there and certainly, uh, you know, in your writer-producer capacity, but also even as a consumer, any content that you, uh, from brands that you find either appealing or annoying? Oh, both. Um... I get a kick out of the Sonic ads because those guys are just improvising. It's not written copy. And uh, TJ Jagodowski is a friend of mine. And uh, strangely enough, the other guy in those Sonic ads looks exactly like my friend Dave Pasquese, who's the regular comedy partner with TJ Jagodowski. 
Dave was also my roommate in college and my comedy partner when I was at Second City, and he was not available on the first day that they shot that. So they got a guy that looked like him to be the straight man, and he's gotta be just kicking himself every time he sees it 11 times a day. Uh, that one day, one day I couldn't come, you know, whatever. But uh, I, I, I get a kick out of those Sonic ads. Uh, the, the raccoon lately for Geico. Uh, oh, yeah. yeah that's, I think that's kind of humorous. I think it's hysterical that Flo gets more range as an actor than anybody in the business right now. She gets to do anything she comes up with, and uh, that's kind of fun to watch. Uh, as far as dislikes, yeah. you know, the, um, a commercial with the actor who's been in the biggest drawing box office hits of all time, asking me what's in my wallet, just hits me to the core. I, I cut up my Capital One card about a year ago. And I, I think when you're looking for people to be your celebrity, yeah, get somebody that might need the money as compared to maybe the richest guy in town. Sam uh, Jackson needs to work, though. I, I mean, no, he's not in enough. No, he's in every goddamn <laughs> thing. Uh, and Jennifer Garner, yeah, you know, she does pretty well on, you know, she her salary. And she gets a good alimony now, yeah. too, right? Yeah, she's, uh... My other pet peeve out there is the new Chester Chia. Um, what is he even talking about? He's, he's got a British voice. He's dangerous. That's what I want in a cheese snack. I was the voice of Chester the Cheetah for 11 years back when he was a rhyming kitty in the heart of Hip City. And, uh, you know the rest of that? It's not easy being cheesy, but it was... It was pretty damn good, and it bought my first house. And uh, I was just a Second City actor, and I went in, and uh, Dan Castellaneta, who's the voice of Homer Simpson and I, it came down to the two of us, and I gave Dan a ride home because I had my mom's car. And uh, I said, you know, I, I think he said, I'll see you tomorrow. And Dan, no, no, he didn't say that. And I, I think so. And he said, well, I got this I got this thing on this Tracy Ullman show where we're going to be doing these little snippets, and that turned into The Simpsons. So he, he might have gotten the better draw on that one. But uh, anyway. You got a house, though. So I got a house. Yeah. I got a house in Los Angeles, California. Nice. So that's, that's saying something these days, or those days. Yeah, yeah, no, hey. Um, so let's talk a little bit more about um, your charitable interests. You know, you and I first met a few years ago. Um, what, on the golf course, it, and that course was the one that you guys caddied at growing up? No, or no? no, there were no caddies at Canal Shores. It's, it's a little muni that runs from Northwestern University to the Baha'i Temple on the evanston Wilmette border, and Canal Shores was actually a derogatory term that we used uh, as Murray brothers, and somebody's like, oh, I like that. That's, that's much better than the Peter Jans Municipal Golf Course. And uh, so they've adopted the name. But um, yeah, we have a, a tournament for first responders every year. Um, it's actually my tournament. My brothers and I also have another one down in St. Augustine, which is pretty much for first responders as well. But uh, that one, my tournament in the Chicago land area just brings in people that were in 9-11, that were in Newtown, Connecticut, that were in all these horrible tragedies. And we just bring these guys into town, ladies and men, uh, and show them a good time for three days of you know music and golf and drinking and Chicago food. I have food. never, this is gonna shock maybe some of you that know me, but I've never played a round of golf where every hole had a bar at it. 16 out of 18 have a bar. 16 out of 18? And then of course the start and the finish. But, what uh, was that drink too? It was, like a, it was like a juice box, but it was like 90% proof. It was, uh, I mean, it's, I was. It's called Buzzbox. Buzzbox. That's a friend's company, and uh, they are adult juice boxes. I mean, I didn't want to bring it home because one of my kids would have got right. it. Right. You know, you know, pack that, that in the like lunch. <laughs> well, yeah, they sell those at the forum here. When you go to a concert at the LA Forum, you can get a margarita pre made. Of, of, and uh, they're actually really good, and uh, they're all oh, they're organic really and whatnot. And they kind of have done well for them. but. Yeah, that's a weird one when you're, you, you got your little straw and you're sipping it and it's 80 proof. You start to act like a three-year-old. Yeah. So it's, uh, it works out. But, uh, but through that, I mean, the amazing charitable causes. And those guys, we, we got to the honor to meet a lot of them. 
and you do use, as I noticed, uh, social media and a lot of or, uh, natural ways to promote and, uh, and PR, et cetera, to get the word out for contributions and attendance and things like that. Well, yeah, we, and we do that for our Caddyshack tournament down in Florida, too. And we've always sell out our sponsors, and uh, we all sell out the golf course. I mean, the Caddyshack tournament, at one point, we filled five full golf courses uh, for the tournament. And, the ensuing parties, but uh, we found that five full golf courses was just too much uh, to, just too many people. So we've cut it down to three full golf courses, which is still a good amount with guests and uh, whatnot. But uh, the, we do put it all on social media and uh, it, it gets gobbled up fast. It's amazing. So what's your, kind of bouncing around here back and forth, but what's, uh, what's your take on the advertising industry as a whole? Do you, does any of this, as working at Mad Men, I know that you, you had a lot of consultants on set, and it was eerily reminiscent of a lot of our careers, and, and, and I had to stop watching it at some point. It was making me nervous, but um, I mean, it was great. Really well done, really well written and executed, of course. Uh, learning through that, learning through what you're viewing out there, is, is there, do you have any points of view on where we're headed? And uh, any points, uh, any POV? Well, uh, I mean, my point of view is that it's very difficult. I mean, you guys are so much more well versed than I am, but you know, that, that ability to grab somebody when you're looking at a, a list of Facebook friends and nonsense, and then there's an ad there. To the ability for that ad to make you actually stop and look at it instead of just scroll by it is, is something incredible. I, I don't know how the ability to do that is, is coming these days. It's it, horrible, though. Don't, yeah. you think, don't think most, most of the ad executions out there are, it, it's a combination today of this wizardry of technical distribution through a variety of sources and platforms, all to deliver a very god awful ad experience. You know, something that like loads halfway and you get charged for some text link, some people, you know, it's, it's just, it doesn't seem like the, the creative, the content is making its way through and matching up to the, all the great ways that we can deliver it. Well, I think it has to go back a little bit to, to the 60s and the 70s where that, that visual that you're stopping on is, is it. it. It's got to be almost a one sheet that you can go, yeah, I, I dig that. And um, it, you can take it in and know what they're advertising. Um, I, but yeah, some of the stuff where you go and you go to another page and then, it, yeah, no, I'm done. You no, well, have and, the time. You know, Mad Men, even up through the 80s and part of the 90s, you could, you could accumulate a, a large audience in a very short period of time. Um, now, it's, you've, you've got to take hundreds of sources to build a cumulative audience to get anywhere near what like head of the class had in 1988. You know, that's, those are like Super Bowl numbers today. Yeah. Et cetera. So even, even more so for these creatives, et cetera. But anyway, I digress. I, I remember we did a golf show with my brothers for Comedy Central, like 2000. And um, we were getting a one, four, one, eight. And those, those are big numbers. Those were, those were nothing then. Right. They, they were not happy with it. Right. And uh, now you get a 1418, people would be, you know, signing you up for three more years. <laughs> mm -hmm. All right, let's have a little fun with uh, some, some memories, if you don't mind. You're the youngest of nine. I'm the ninth of nine. So how'd you survive that with, the, with that family? Well, I'm glad I got a full head of hair because there's a lot of scars up here <laughs> um, from sporting events with my brothers. We used to play till I bled. But uh, we grew up in a big family. My father was a diabetic and a very slow eater. So my mom made dinner for 11 of us every night and we would eat in 45 to 60 seconds. And then we would entertain my father for the rest of the meal. And the goal in life was to get him to laugh with food in his mouth or preferably milk. And uh, that's kind of, you know, the social interaction every night is where everybody might have gotten their comedy chops. And, uh, my brother Brian wrote for Saturday Night Live for 11 years. He wrote Caddyshack. Uh, my sister's a nun. She has a goofy point of view. My brother Billy was always very funny. But you learned a lot about timing, too, because if you said something stupid earlier, you were just shut out the rest of the dinner. But uh, I, I think that's something that's missing a lot in families today, is that we don't sit down and eat together and uh, have that time. And a lot of kids just don't have social skills. I was spending a lot of time in Chicago for the World Series with a couple of my nephews who 
you know, um, this guy was, uh, well, he was talking to me earlier, and um, he, uh, he said, finish the goddamn sentence, you know, they, they have this ability to just think they're the, the center of the universe, and, and they can take all the time in the world. I, I, it just drove me insane. I almost slapped this kid about 11 times. But yeah, it, it, it helps you socially, it helps you, you know, in so many levels. But. Well, and also you had to contend with all the kids who had been waiting all their lives to see the Cubs win the pennant oh. too, right? The first game, it was all these really wealthy fathers with their four and five-year-old sons who had waited so long to see the Cubs in the World Series. You wanted to slap them, and they're watching their iPad the whole game, and then it was rough. It was rough. Oh, my God. Well, thank you, Joel. This has been amazing. We have a, a couple uh, minutes.